Music and Modern Fandom, the Cultural Dimensions of Online Music. We can get a sense of the value of big data to the music industry. It can reveal music and social platform use patterns, the music people stream and share, which recording artists are resonating, and this information is multifaceted and virtually instantaneous. So insights can be made earlier and they're based on empirical, hard data. So what people have actually done. The top picture is Sam Goody, which was a chain of record stores that was around for 50 years and closed in 2006. The bottom picture is for music video by a Korean pop star named Psy, and this is for Gangnam Style, which went viral a couple years ago and currently has about two and a half billion streams on YouTube. Cultural change makes new kinds of data, especially big data, important. I think a good question to pose is our data material culture. And for anthropologists, material culture is the product of cultural behavior. Data would definitely fit into that category. So if we think about data as a new kind of anthropological artifact, we take a perspective that would be like thick data, coined by Tricia Wing, who's a tech ethnographer, in an article called Big Data Needs Thick Data in 2013. The basis for this term is from Clifford Gertz, who employed a methodology called thick description, where he would write down everything that was said and done, all the verbal communication, all the nonverbal communication, all the subtext, all the things you can't really get from quantitative data, and then interpret that. Thick data can provide context to big data. This chart is the social 50, which is based on next big sounds data around streaming and sharing online. Just Bieber's number one, Adele's number two, and since it's from 2011, LMFAO is at number six. But the current chart has Justin Bieber at number one and Adele at number three. Big data tends to focus on what's happening and thick data tends to focus on why it's happening. Thick data goes beyond numbers and it's produced through the social and behavioral sciences. Methodologies like ethnography, participant observation, in-depth interviews, and so on. It allows for exploring aspects like cognition, which are also very helpful for predictive research. I think thick data and big data are important now for the same reason, and that's because of increasing complexity. Technological complexity, cultural complexity, social complexity. And data change with new forms of human expression and behavior, which are enabled by new technologies, which in turn produce more data, both hard data and soft data. These technologies also shape our relationships. Something that the study showed was that it's impossible to talk about human relationships in a meaningful way without talking about music. These are two headlines from articles that both came out last year in March. The first one is here's why companies are desperate to hire anthropologists. And the second is why big data is a big deal. This study took place in New York City and Austin, Texas, and currently has five participants who are 23 and 24 years old. Our ethnographic sessions lasted between two and three and a half hours. This presentation is going to focus on how participants interact with music online and the role of music in personal relationships. We can start with some insights around family since family members are our first friends and followers. Kelly's father was a roadie and he talked with her about his days touring with these legendary groups. And this helped her to gain an appreciation for older music. So her current music preferences, she describes as being old. She talks about a music station that she created on Pandora, where she used her favorite feature, which is adding variety to a station. And the music that she chose is music that her dad would like and that she would love. Henrique shares music with his sisters. One is biological and another is a friend who's so close that he considers her his sister. He's noticing that music from Brazil where he's from originally, is becoming more important now that he's been in the U.S. for a few months. I did have a, like a playlist that I just kind of put in a bunch of different varieties of like music that I thought my dad would really like to and that I mm -hmm. loved. So I, ha I don't know which one, I don't know where that went. I don't know why it's not on here. But yeah, there was one mm -hmm. that might have been like a 60-year-old bass one or mm -hmm. a really old bass one. Or Mm -hmm. 
And what was that? It was Los Hermanos. It was it's a it's a band that I used to listen when I was like probably eight or nine years old, mm -hmm. and it was something that we used to listen together. And mm -hmm. she was in a concert, and she recorded it for me and for mm -hmm. my sister. And sent it on on WhatsApp. Yeah, she sent me on WhatsApp. There's it's a group that we have. It's me and my two sisters. Mm -hmm. And we send each other like everything that we find at school or something nice. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of her or, or them. Another important aspect is friendship. Anthropology of Big Data would chase the stories behind it. And Marielle conveys the importance of music through her stories. Um, and Zaleha, I got to know her through um, university. And uh, music is. And we one of the first thing one of the things that made us best friends is like one day she just wrote to me on Facebook out of the blue. We had just like gone to a random like um, f winter fair together on a whim because we had mutual friends who were going. And uh, then she writes to me on Facebook on uh, uh, you know just like out of the blue and says, "Hey, so I have this ti these tickets to a Jesse Ware concert in Leeds, which is like, uh, what is it like a." four hour, five hour bus ride from London. She's like, yeah, and I really want to go, but I, my friend canceled on me. So do you want them? And uh, is there anyone you know who would want to go with you? Um, I just told her like, why don't we both go? And so, and this was like two days before the actual concert was being held. Mm -hmm. So that we just like bought the bus tickets and um, just went up all the way to Leeds, like way in North England, for it just to be there for 24 hours for this one Jesse Ware concert because the mm -hmm. London concert was sold out. <laughs> so that's how you guys became best friends. Yeah, we went up there and it was an amazing concert. And then we, after the concert, we went to this bar where they were only playing like soul music and Motown. And we were just like, this is the coolest bar ever. Oh my God, I've always wanted to just dance this music all night. <laughs> so we, yeah, and we just like became best friends after that trip. Like, like, yeah, music really brought us together. And ever since then, we've been sharing music. That clip ended before Marielle started talking about how she uses music streaming platforms to share music and also to listen to it. She shares music as a way to nurture her relationships. And this takes place online, and it also takes place in person. Kelly has older taste in music, in large part because of the influence of her father. But she also has Pandora stations and playlists on other platforms that she describes as being younger for when she has people over. We can see how big data and anthropology can benefit each other through a story like Marielle's. It starts with an exchange on Facebook, and then you buy the tickets for this concert that you decide to go to online, and then you go to the concert using Google Maps or Waze, and then you check in on Facebook and Foursquare, and then you tag yourself in an Instagram photo, and then you leave the concert and find a soul bar and have the time of your life, and then a song comes on that you don't know the name of, so then you take out your phone and then shazam it. Data is human. It's a part of our humanity at this point. So we should embrace it anthropologically. The last aspect that I'll cover in this talk is romance. All of our female participants discussed how past relationships shaped their music preferences. So Kelly revealed the influence of her past love interests. And she also revealed how music is shared for indirect communication. And this is something that we saw with other participants as well. If you're feeling a certain way, you might post a song to convey how you're feeling. But when it comes to romance, this often takes on a more passive aggressive tone. And this is something that our participants talked about in current platforms, posting to send a message to somebody. And this also goes back to the days of AOL Instant Messenger or AIM, which had a feature that showed what you're listening to. Kelly talks about this, but she talks about a song called I Don't Want You Back that she shared indirectly with her ex-boyfriend who she was still connected to on AOL Instant Messenger. I thought I'd kind of stop in high school, or I would like <laughs> In middle school, I liked rap because some guy liked rap. In high school, I liked that emo stuff because this guy that I really liked was in an emo band. And then when I 
was dating my boyfriend in high school, or college rather, he was like really into, he was really, actually this is pretty good too, he was really into like EDM or house music, whatever it was, to the point where like he recruited me to create this, <laughs> this like, you know like fratmusic.com, those like EDM sites where you can like find all like the recent, uh, well we created a, a website. Yeah, there was this guy in high school that I loved for like ever as a best friend. He like told me all these things, finally like made me like feel like we would have like had a shot at me at like this like relationship. And then he like I don't even know. I like finally caved, and then he like ended up like hooking up with some other girl. Oh. And then we weren't friends anymore, and it was like nothing. Mm -hmm. But you you were still friends on on, on AOL and some Messenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think so this was probably, like you. sophomore year of high school. Uh huh. Yeah, this is after the, the emo phase. Mm -hmm. So the emo phase was like freshman year. Participants' mm -hmm. live stages have soundtracks. They're documented through their Pandora stations and playlists on other platforms. They're shifting from a focus on making friendships through music, as they did during their emo and hipster days, to nurturing friendships. And these extend to friendships with family members. This is reflected in their music preferences and their use of music platforms. Some of their phases in life are forgettable, and some of them are more meaningful, like when Marielle was interviewing for a job in New York and listening to a song called Moving to New York by the Wombats. We can see the importance of music from home and the value tied to participants' sense of self. And this is actually useful in thinking about new music as well. So we got a sense of Kelly's sensibility when it comes to music as being very old or mature. She's kind of an old soul when it comes to music. And her last music related Instagram post is about Adele and a song called When We Were Young. Her caption is, yep, consuming my Friday and quite possibly my weekend. It seems like it's possible to start integrating big data and thick data into a new kind of mixed methods research. We can apply anthropology to innovation research, and that's something that's being done a lot through market research, design research, and user experience research. But we should also consider counter-corporate, more academic studies that are focused not on marketing anything or designing anything or the user experience, but the human experience. We're trying to understand more fundamental things, like how people relate to technology and music and how they use this in how they nurture their relationships with other people. There's an argument to be made that it's impractical because you are trying to get something that's very, very basic and fundamental. And in the corporate world, when you're trying to understand things, you're usually spending money and not making it. But there's also an argument for it being timely because when we think about how technology is changing our culture, it's often around fundamental behaviors. This may be why companies are desperate to hire anthropologists or at least more open to it.